This afternoon on Joy Newsroom, NPP firms up reorganization preparations to the 2024 general elections as it concludes election of parliamentary candidates in often constituencies. We'll bring you reports from across the country on this exercise and hear from the party on the next line of action. Was the OSP right in his public outburst about the frustration hindering his delivery in the fight against corruption in the country? Well, we'll hear from Dean of UPSC as he shares his thoughts about this developing story. I strongly support what the OSP is doing. The OSP is an office which is involved in public interest litigation. I think it's important for us to understand that public interest litigation is not just another regular litigation. And later in the bulletin, we take you to the Upper West Region, where the newly crowned regional best farmer wants government to consider the ban on the exportation of soya beans. There has been a limited restriction on marketing of soya beans. I'm seriously appealing to the government of Ghana through the Honorable Regional Minister for government to actually reconsider the restriction place or ban on saving. My name is Faustina Safa, where your home of independent, fearless, and credible journalism. Do stay for details. Thanks for choosing us. Now, the governing New Patriotic Party is firming up preparations ahead of the 2024 general elections as it targets to break the historic eight in governance. So far, the party has elected its flag bearer and conducted elections for its offense constituencies yesterday. The outstanding last reorganization process will be the selection of parliamentary candidates in constituencies of incumbent MPs. It is a crucial moment for the NPP as the campaign heats up, but the newly selected candidates are already expressing optimism of snatching back the seats they lost to the NDC in the 2020 elections. Let's start from the Legikuku constituency here in the Greater Accra region. The delegates of Legikuku NPP have made their decision for the party. A majority of them believe the NHIA boss, Dr. Bernard Okoboy, is the man to lead the party to victory in the 2024 general election. Listen to the EC officer declaring him winner after the elections. Now the first candidate, Dr. Okoboy, had 902. So ladies and gentlemen, I declare Dr. Okoboy as a parliamentary candidate elect for the MPP for the 2024 elections. On his part, Dr. Bernard Okoboy, who is leading the party, for the third time in the general election, is preaching unity while indicating that the reaffirmation of his candidacy is an indication that he is capable of snatching the seat back from the NDC. Let me say a big thank you to all my supporters. Let me say a big thank you for all those who voted for me. Let me also thank those who did not vote for me. It does not matter if they did not vote for me today. What is important is we working together tomorrow. And I want to assure them that as their general, I am leading them to battle. And there's only one outcome, victory December 7, 2024. Thank His three contenders have all thrown their support behind him with the pledge of campaigning vigorously for the MPP to win the seat. Democracy has spoken within the party. The party today is a winner. I will entreat everyone to pledge our support to our newly elected parliamentary candidate. Our role as patriots is to make sure that each and every one of us supports Dr. Okoboye to win the seat in 2024. There is no party that can break the eight apart from the new patriotic party. So I call on all of us, police station executives, to unite after today. So that we can go out there, reclaim the seat, and make Dr. Baumia the next president of the Republic of Ghana. On the part of the supporters of the MPP, 
the much anticipated 2024 general election is a done deal for the party with the selection of Dr. Bernard Okoboy. NDC has nothing in Leje could come in 2024 because the people themselves are very, very disappointed in Ayuku. Currently, they don't have an MP. We have an MP here. The 2024 election is a done deal for Dr. Bernard Okoboy. We've made a mistake in the past. We've not realized our mistakes. And we are ever ready to say, Dr. Bernardo Koboy, we are sorry. I believe strongly that this time around he's going to take the mantle over the uh, opponent, NDC, and he's going to come back to power. Lejokuku constituency is one of the populous constituencies in Ghana. The battle lines have now been drawn between the two major political parties, NDC and MPP, who have been fighting for the seat since 1996. Your election headquarters will continue to follow the evolving events here leading to the main elections. Reporting from Lejokuku constituency here in the Greater Accra region, Samuel Mbura, Joy News. Let's stay in the Greater Accra region and take you to Ablikuma Central where the Director of Communications at the Presidency, Jeff Sisaki, emerged winner. It was a filled day for delegates who were gifted cash and fed until they could eat no more. My colleague Michael Ashali was there and filed this report. Ibn Zanate, Collins Amwa, Lawrence Anyate Ajay, Jefferson Kwamina Saki, four aspirants, one goal to lead the new patriotic party into the 2024 parliamentary elections. Unlike Collins, Jefferson and Lawrence, who are running for the first time, Ebenezer has been here before. In 2016, he won the primaries and went on to secure victory for the NPP. But everyone was expecting him to win. I strongly believe that I stand a better chance of winning the 2024 because I have been there compared to the NDC candidates, who is also an incumbent. For delegates, it was a field day. Gotcha. Boss, I mean, are, are you enjoying yourself? More than enjoyment. At least three candidates were providing assorted food for breakfast and lunch. You name it. I eat rice, wache, and kokonte. Interesting. One person, you. Yeah, only Since you. morning. Since morning. Three drinks. Minum tea, kosiana bread. The icing on the cake was the cash in branded envelopes that were given to delegates under the guise of transport fare from some of the aspirants. Yeah, more than 2,000 cities. More than 2,000. And they give me a lot of fare too right now. Yeah, they give me a lot of fare too. We got a lot of money. Money. This is the first time. This, you see. This is the money. We never experienced this before. You see, it's, it's my money. Uh, media. My bro, look at you, Abba. Some of the aspirants didn't deny it. And this is the biggest um, uh, uh, food, should I say, stand that you can see on, on the platform here. They came to vote and, you know, once they are going back, I need to give them their uh, transport, their TNT. So, that so is, that's what's in the branded envelopes you are giving them? Yes, you know, we need to reward them in a very nice way. Yeah, so giving them money in an envelope is a normal thing that uh, everybody does in this country. After six intense hours of voting, the time had come to tally the ballot. The aspirants, visibly anxious and drenched in sweat, were on edge, keenly observing the proceedings. Election Joseph Mensah Sam. The returning the officer for the Blekuma Central Bruce. constituency finally revealed the hard-end results after nearly an hour of meticulous ballot counting. We have Ebenezer Gilbert Nina Nati obtain a vote of 441. Collins Amwa obtain a vote of 493. Lawrence Anyate Ajay obtain a vote of 11. Jefferson Kwabina Saki obtained a vote of 539. At the end, three losers and one victor. The losing aspirants pledged to support the candidate. We will support him to make this constituency great again. What next for you? Well, I'll be around and I'll still be in the constituency to still support them in any way that they want.
Many are wondering, are you going to take back your television and money? No, 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 no. Uh, it's a reward which I did promise them. And I think this is part of democracy. But I hope and believe that we all rally behind the candidates to unseat the NDC and make sure that we bring the aid come on the 7th of December. Jefferson Tsaki, who won by a small margin, promised to improve the fortunes of the party and promised to unseat the NDC MP. The other aspirant, I want to assure them that the unity that we have always been preaching of in our party, I'm definitely going to be working with them. So what, what next? Well, we are going to sit down, think through it, uh, meet the delegates again, now go beyond the party, go through the various things, especially in our constituency. But I can promise you that it's going to be a door-to-door -door affair on a daily basis, going to the constituents, preaching the good works of Nana Adodankwa Ekufuado and Alhaji Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. Finally, what do you say to the NDC candidate Latif Dan? Latif Dan should be ready because there's a new energy that is in Ablikuma Central constituency now. For Joy News, Michael Ashali. Let's head now to the Ashanti region. The new patriotic party in the Asawasi constituency has elected Manafi Ibrahim as its candidate for the 2024 parliamentary elections. Manafi Ibrahim is calling for party unity to win the seat for the first time. There's more in this report. First and foremost, I would want to thank the members of the party in the Asawasi constituency. I would also like to thank my friends, my family who understood me. And then I want to thank the Almighty God who protected me throughout this process. I want to appeal to all the other aspirants, my uncle Yusuf Usman and then our regional treasurer Jiazena. This is the time that we have to unite and then deliver this seat. It is not good for our image that all of us come from this constituency and then for 20 solid years we continue to be defeated within the heart of our traditional stronghold. So I want to thank each and every one of us here, our friends from the media, the electoral commission, the police, of course, our national officer here and then the municipal chief executive, all other constituency executives. In the course of the campaign, we'll be engaging the media and then we'll be having a conversation as to how we want our constituency to look at in the next weeks and months before the elections. I want to thank everyone once again. Thank you. Let's go to the phone lines now and speak to the Deputy General Secretary of the NPP, Haruna Mohammed. It's a pleasure joining us here on Joe Newsroom. First off, how would you describe the conduct of the just ended election? Would you say the party is satisfied with the outcome? Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to say good afternoon to your charity viewers out there. And straight um, forward to your question. I think that the party is very satisfied with the outcome of the elections that were held today, uh, yesterday. Um, three constituency elections two are also happening today, uh, which was scheduled for 3rd December, uh, that is today. Um, I think that all in all, from the presidential election um, to this parliamentary for the orphan constituency has been so well, very peaceful. And um, we are left with the sitting members of parliament, uh, which we have put out the timetable on the 20th of this month, who we'll opened the nominations for sitting members of parliament, uh, 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 constituencies, for people who are interested to pick nominations, who we'll also go in to pick the nominations. Mm. Isolated cases of vote buying, which delegates confess to on live television. Will the party consider investigation into these illegalities? Because clearly your constitution is against it. Um, I can't say that um, people have perpetrated vote buying. Um, I've seen on your screen showing people holding money, but I've not seen people giving them money. And I've also heard that they have taken transport 
and obviously not that they have been given money to vote for preferred candidates. So I will not be able to verify that the party has a whole chapter in our constitution, in Article 4 of our party's constitution, that talks about disciplinary procedures and grievance procedures. If any of these matters infringes on the party's constitution, the party will not hesitate to look at them. But until then, this remains a reportage that when not filed to or investigated, we would not be able to conclude that this were vote by him. See. What's next for the party? Um, for us as a party, uh, we are done with presidential primaries. We have our flag bearer. Uh, we are also done with orphan constituencies, except the cases of seven constituencies that we have withheld uh, for reasons that National Executive Committee uh, have cited. Uh, we will be moving in to conduct primaries in where we have 50 members of parliament. That is what is up next for us. And like I said, on the 20th of December, we will open nominations and close nominations on 22nd of December. These are the activities that is ahead of us. Uh, with this particular conduct, uh, we are not uh, uh, in any jubilation mood at all. Nobody has won, nobody has lost. It is the MPP that has won. And that is what we look out for, to be able to galvanize forces, put ourselves together, unite ahead of 2024 general elections, where we would be winning the parliamentary elections and winning the presidential elections as well. Thank you for joining us. Haruna Mohammed is Deputy General Secretary of the NPP. Now, thankfully, we also have the Deputy General Secretary of the NDC, Mustafa Bandi, joining us live here on Joe Newsroom. First off, what's your session of the election yesterday? The candidates elected by the NPP, they say they are poised to take the seat from the NEC. Do you see that happening? Uh, thank you very much. Um, for me and for the NDC, uh, it's good that uh, our certain MPs from today would know who their opponents are going to be. The NDC is going to win the 2024 election generally on strategy. Strategy that will be decentralized on case by case, constituency to constituency basis. And for us, we are happy. The caliber of people that have been elected. Again, it, uh, it's good to emphasize that yesterday was a display of unjustified acquired wealth, sharing of money by various aspirants who are officials of government. Uh, if you take Dr. Okuboy, for example, is presiding over a collapsed national health insurance, but he's got money to share for primaries. It's good that they've gotten they finally shared some of the money to constituents. But again, he will be answering why he is presiding over a collapsed institution, yet got money to share. If you look at Jefferson Saki, for example, um, you've seen the, him himself justifying why vote buying and sharing of money is a practice in the MPP. But Jefferson Saki will be answering in 2015 till today where he got that kind of money to be sharing to constituents and what his contribution at the grassroots level have been. Again, Ghanaians are looking forward to rebuild a destroyed Ghana. Ghanaians are looking forward for a government that will come into power with an overwhelming majority. And so campaign in every constituency where we have a sitting MP start from today for the NDC, it is hard work in the morning, it is hard work in the evening, and it is strategy every day. We are going to win each seat on grounds of hard work, the performance of each 
parliamentarian in parliament, and then on the strength of the party's good faith campaign. That is what the NDC uh, thinks or seek to do. Mm. Mustafa Bande, his Deputy General Secretary of the NDC, thank you for joining us here on Joy Newsroom. Now, Ghana will this week host the United Nations Peacekeeping Ministerial Meeting. It aims to address the security and operational challenges being faced by the UN peacekeepers and generate support for these missions deployed across the country. Now, ahead of the meeting, the Defence Minister Dominic Intuo, the Information Minister Kujopo Nkrumah, and the Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister Kweko Aprantum Sapong will be holding a press conference. Well, let's take you live to the Information Ministry, where it is currently happening. It's on women and in peacekeeping, an environmental aspect of peacekeeping. The side of meetings will be jointly organized with Sweden and the U.S. respectively. The second day, the fifth, with the main conference will be addressed by His Excellency the Vice President because the President is actually out of the country and so he has designated the Vice to do that on his behalf, which will be followed by three panel sections which will be conveyed on three teams that Ghana selected, including women in peacekeeping, protection of civilians in peacekeeping, mental health of peacekeepers, safety and security of peacekeepers, and strategic communications in peacekeeping. It is difficult and an expensive job to do peacekeeping. And for Ghana to continue to excel, Ghana needs a lot of credit. Countries will continue to participate in peacekeeping and to offer there are men and women in uniform, both police and the soldiers and other security services. They need commendation. And so the forum is expected to, to showcase digital exhibition of Africa's role in the peacekeeping enterprise. What we call the LC Initiative. CELC Initiative is a collaborative effort between Canada and five other African countries that is largely centered on women in peacekeeping and the role of women in peacekeeping and the efforts of women in peacekeeping and why women should be in peacekeeping. So in the margins of the after-mentioned events, several bilateral meetings are expected to be held in rooms that have been earmarked and put in shape for that purpose. These meetings are important, ladies and gentlemen, because no nation can do it alone. Even the most powerful nations need allies. And so it is important that as we defend our nation against the threat of terrorism, as we defend our, na our, na our nation against the threat of piracy in the sea, and any other threat that Ghana may face, it is important to have allies. And in such meetings are those that you cut a lot of allies. You talk to people, you hold bilateral meetings, you strike a deal with people. And so Ghana will take advantage on this to ensure that we continue to protect our nation and make our country a free nation and make our country a peaceful nation that would attract further conferences. Because if United Nations military peace meeting, meeting can come to Ghana, then what else cannot come to Ghana? Ghana is ready to host any other meeting, any other event. Tourists are invited to Ghana to come to Ghana because Ghana is safe. The statement by the United Nations to hold this meeting is a big statement. It's a big statement that will, will cut across all spheres of our lives. It's a statement that is letting the world know that if you want a free, if you want a, um, a, a, a safe, and you want a peaceful country in Africa, go to Ghana. That's why we, they are coming here. And so people are invited to come to Ghana. People listening to us today. And even Ghanaians should know that their country is safe, their country is peaceful, and that their country is ready to host the world on the 5th and then on the 6th. But tomorrow, a lot of businesses will begin to arrive and will ask Ghanaians to assist us. Let them know the proverbial Ghanaian hospitality that they usually will show to visitors, who may be coming for the first time and who want to have a good impression about Ghana, who may decide to go to the markets, who may decide to go to town, who may decide to go to our shop bars, who may decide to go to our restaurants or our beaches, let them know 
the type of Ghana that we have here and we are proud of. I thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Please, another round of applause for the Minister for Defence, who is also the Member of Parliament for Bimbala. Colleagues, we will be taking your questions for our speakers. We want to do this um, within 30 minutes, so as we always do it, please, you take the microphone, you mention your name, and then you tell us uh, what your question is. While we wait for that, let me acknowledge the presence of the Chief of Defence Staff, Vice Admiral Seth. Well, that was the United Nations Peacekeeping Ministerial Meeting. We'll be giving you more updates on that in subsequent bulletins. Let's shift our attention to other stories now. Dean of the University of Professional Studies Law Faculty, Enes Kofi, finds nothing wrong in the decision by the Office of the Special Prosecutor to update the nation on cases being handled and the frustrations in prosecuting them. The OSP KC jabbing at a news conference this week accused some judges of bias in handling cases filed by the Office of the Special Prosecutor. The comments have generated discussions, questioning the country's commitment to fight corruption. Speaking on News File, UPSA Law Faculty Dean Enix Kofi says the OSB must fix some challenges hindering his progress. I strongly support what the OSP is doing. The OSP is an office which is involved in public interest litigation. I think it's important for us to understand that public interest litigation is not just another regular litigation. It is involved in the defense of the public interest. And when you are involved in the defense of the public interest, you ought to give feedback to the persons who are interested in the litigation involved or in the prosecution involved. The OSP therefore occupies an office which not only is in Novel, but an office which was called into being by the public, so to speak. This is a matter that dominated political conversation for many years. I do not see and understand what the reason is that after having been established, the OSP should operate in private. Mind you, we have to bear this in mind that the OSP is interested in public facilitation of its work. And so if an office is interested in the public facilitation of his work, that, that office invariably would have to engage that public. It is when the OSP speaks to the public that the public can be aware of the extent to which the OSP's work is progressing, what the difficulties and challenges are, and if the public thinks that there are any circumstances of complementing the OSP's work, the public may, so to speak, um, come out and engage. So I think the OSP is doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Justice is not... It shouldn't, it's not and shouldn't be a private business. You know, lawyers have traditionally said this, that, look, let's keep some of these things quiet. The legal actors who are supposed to be quiet are known. Jurors and um, judges themselves, they speak through the bench. The people who are supposed to be quiet are there. Indeed, lawyers who are involved in particular cases. And I've had lawyers on radio, and I think these days the media funds that. But it's quite unprofessional. And that, that I totally disagree with lawyers who do that. In other words, lawyers who are involved in cases in court, uh, coming out of court and then literally continuing the, trans continuing the litigation on radio or on TV, you know, and basically arguing against each other publicly. That I think is a bit unprofessional. But that is not what the OSP is doing. What the OSP is doing is to give public feedback on specific developments on cases involving um, matters before, before, before him. So I do not have any difficulty at all with the fact that he's given updates or periodic updates of happenings in court. Well, I mean, some will argue that the office of the OSP is perhaps one of the most difficult offices anybody can occupy in public service in Ghana. And the reason for that is that it is an office that requires the level of facilitation which ordinarily doesn't obtain in our criminal justice system. The OSP is supposed to be a forensically led office, fund fundamentally speaking. And forensics, as we all know, forensic investigation in Ghana is still very much rudimentary. You are investigating offenses that are essentially consensual in character, offenses in which parties are collaborators and cooperative in terms of their behavior, behaviors. Well, former Member of Parliament for Tamale Central, Inusa Fusaini, says the OSB must be ready to face some challenges in his desire to put corrupt officials in jail. I have tremendous sympathy for the OSP. It was a difficult legislation. It was difficult because 
The first challenge we anticipated actually when we passed the law was that someone will carry us to court to say that we had done an unconstitutional act. But you see, why didn't anybody go to court? Because there's consensus by the whole country that we have tackled the canker of corruption. There are only two things that are essential in defeating corruption. Disclosures and transparency. So, yes, the uh, special prosecutor used unconventional means to vent his frustrations, his lamentations, the obstacles that are being put on him. He says it's no fair. Is it true? And indeed, it's no fair. He's not been aided because he's a lawyer. But you must understand, and uh, Professor Abuchi knows him very well, that he was a diligent academic, very hard working lawyer. Mm. He's, he's been put in an office, and now his competence is being called into, called, called into question. He's fighting to protect his own reputation and integrity. The office itself has great difficulty. I was the first person to criticize his appointment. Because I know what corruption can do. Corruption can be deadly. Corruption can be destructive, not only to the economy, but to the individual. Several, several corruption, anti-corruption, I mean, uh, I mean, fighters have been killed. Judges, I mean, I mean, I say judges, journalists have borne the highest brunt of people, killed them with impunity. The mortar case is still pending. So when he was appointed, I thought he had a, a very young family. And <laughs> that family itself was now vulnerable. He himself was being vulnerable. I didn't anticipate and think that a political party that had made it an issue in which Ghanaians bought into will work to frustrate the operationalization of the office. I didn't think, I didn't think that would be I mean, his problem. But now that is what is happening. For political scientist and development fellow with the Center for Democratic Development, Dr. John Osai Kwapan, is worried about the development and how it will further dampen the confidence of the public in the judiciary. This fight against corruption is much tougher than anyone can imagine, um, that is going to take a long time, etc., etc. So you sensitize the public to how difficult this, this fight against corruption is. The, the part where I disagree with the, with the special prosecutor is, um, you know, going into the specifics of, you know, particular rulings and his disagreements with that. But also couching in a language that seems to suggest that um, there is some sort of concerted effort on the part of the judiciary to make his work difficult. That I, uh, that I think is, is, is very worrying. And it's also very worrying because the judiciary is not enjoying the best of public perception um, at this moment. Uh, you mentioned Afrobarometer, so I have to throw in Afrobarometer <laughs> once again. But if you look at the question of trust uh, in our courts of law and the perception in our, in our, you know, in our, in our, in our courts of law, based on, you know, um, the Afrobarometer data. The courts are not enjoying the best of public perceptions. And you need, and, and again, the level of trust is also at an all-time low. So when you combine all of these things, where you need to get citizens to find ways to repose or regain their confidence and trust in, the, in, the, in, in this very institution, then it becomes even more worrying when the, when the special prosecutor comes out and gives this press conference and say the kinds of things that may reinforce some of the, uh, the suspicions or the mistrust that citizens are already having you know, um, you know, in the court. And it is not every time that you would expect to quote unquote, win a case in a court of law. For me, win or lose, 
so long as the institution followed all the right you know procedures and dealt with the case in a fair and impartial manner then we must respect the outcome Upper West Regional Minister Dr. Hafiz Bin Sali has charged municipal and district assemblies in the region to properly resource offices of social welfare department to enable them identify indigents and vulnerable persons. Speaking at the Upper West Regional Coordinating Meeting at Jirapa, Dr. Bin Sali noted that though the region has achieved universal coverage of registration of members, it needs to rest on its oars. Joe News' Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafik Salam reports from Jirapa. West Regional Minister Dr. Hafiz Bin Sali revealed that for two consecutive years, only the Upper West and Mono regions have achieved universal health coverage regarding NHIS membership registrations. He therefore commended the Upper West Region Directorate of the NHIA and urged municipal and district assemblies in the region to properly resource the social welfare officers to identify indigents and vulnerable persons for free membership registrations to the scheme. As of 30th September 2023, total membership registration stood at 684,567, representing 80% achievement of their 2023 target. This also covers about 73% of the total population of the Upper West Region. I therefore wish to use this opportunity to appeal to the management of our assemblies to properly resource their wealth, social welfare offices to assist the management of national, national health insurance scheme in identifying indigents and the vulnerable to, for free membership registration. Meanwhile, the Upper West Region Directorate of the NHIA is not resting on its oars and as part of activities to mark the establishment of the 20th anniversary of the NHIS, the NHIA has embarked on a sensitization drive to educate the people on the new online registration app, My NHIS app. The app provides an easy to use a modern digital platform to allow the NHIS members across the country to conveniently access membership services. Officials of the NHIA in the Upper West Region took a float through some principal streets in the one municipality, sensitizing and educating the public about their latest online invention. Senior Monitoring and Evaluation Officer at the Upper West Region's Office of the NHIA, Abdul Rahman Al Hassan is leading the charge. So this is an alternative method of renewing or registering your card, which include, you can, when you download the car, uh, the app and install, you can use this app to uh, renew your card. You can use it to register and get a fresh e-card on your phone. You can access the benefit package on this app you can also renew other members on this app. You can get the drug list on this app. You can also communicate to us through the message option. So the app contains a lot. And uh, we think it's even the better option when it comes to uh, health insurance renewal, health insurance registration, because you can do it at your convenience. You can do it in your bed, you can do it wherever you are. They ended the float at the worker jet here where they set up registration centers to sensitize traders at the West Central Business District. Reporting for the news, Rafik Salam, Jiriba. Still on health, the government of the United States is investing over $1 million in the construction of the state of the art maternal and child care center at the Hope Exchange Medical Center in Kumasi. The new facility will include a labor and delivery suite, neonatal and pediatric intensive care units, 
inpatient and outpatient wards and adolescent clinics. U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Virginia Palmer, says the U.S. invests over $12 million annually to improve the health of mothers, babies and children across the country. Here's a report by Clinton Yibwa. The current infant mortality rate in Ghana is 30.8 deaths per 1,000 live births, which is a 3.04% decline from 2022. Concerted efforts resulting in improved infrastructure and skilled care have been acknowledged to be the foundation of progressive improvements in the sector. The Hope Exchange Medical Center, which serves approximately 4 million people in the Ashanti region and beyond, is set to host the Maternity and Child Center. According to the U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Virginia Palmer, the facility will facilitate maternal and antenatal care. In agriculture, education, governance and security. And every year we invest about $12 million to improve the health and lives of mothers and babies and children across the country. We make these investments because we know that the quality of maternal and antenatal care means that healthier moms and newborns means healthier families, healthier communities and healthier Ghana. And a healthy start is the first step to a lifetime of good health. Quality and effective maternal, newborn and child care requires basic building blocks, infrastructure, basic equipment, medical supplies, and especially skilled care. USAID is committed to working with the government of Ghana, the private sector and communities to ensure that all of these building blocks are available here in Kumasi and across Ghana. General Manager of Hope Exchange Medical Center, Dominic Osei disclosed the project will take 18 months to become operational. In Ghana, and it's going to take one and a half years, that is 18 months to be completed. And this is a three-story block, and it's going to take care of all maternal and child health um, cases. So it's a big burden. And uh, we give thanks to the government and people of America for such a donation. They have been supporting Hope Exchange uh, over the years with a lot of equipment uh, and this is a major support from the government people of America. At the project, uh, after the construction of the building, like I said, we're going to have a, a place for antenatal care, we're going to have a place for NICU, we're going to have a place for ICU for kids, um, we're going to have a place for staff offices, there's also going to be a place for mothers whose children will be on admission in the hospital and uh, yes, for all maternal cases. Reporting for Joy News Clinton. Yeah, we're we'll taking a quick breather here on Joy Newsroom. When we return, we'll take you to the Upper West region and tell you about this year's National Best Farmer. Do stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. You're watching Joy Newsroom with me, Faustina Safa. We can now turn our attention to the agri sector where the Korean International Cooperation Agency is concluding a five-year agricultural project under its Rise Value Chain Initiative in the Central Region. The project, which spans across five districts in the region, engaging 514 farmers affiliated with 11 farmer-based organizations, is expected to make the region a hub of right production. There's more in this report. The Koika Rise Production Initiative sought to empower farmers improve agricultural practices and promote a more efficient and profitable rice production sector in the central region. The initiative prioritized five districts within the region. At the Farmers' Day celebration, Regional Minister Justina Marigodasan highlighted the series of agricultural initiatives that the region has championed with the support of the local people and the development partners. In the central region, one particular product that assumed a very important attention is the value chain in rice production. So we call it the Rice Value Chain Improvement Project with support from the South Korean government, represented by the Korean International Cooperation Agency, COICA, a five-year project which ends this year, 2023, covered five districts involving 514 farmers that belongs to 11 farmer-based organizations located in nine communities. A five-ton state of the arts rice processing factory put out by the project at Asin Propong in the Asin Fosu municipality will be commissioned very soon. 
Plans are far advanced to launch the central rice, a product of this project. It is my hope that when this product is launched, all of us will patronize it. Justina Marigodas and assured government is working hard to enhance agricultural production. Central Regional Director of Agric, Dr. Peter Omega, was excited about the future of Agric in the region, emphasizing the initiatives that have been championed. Reflecting on this year's tea, delivering smart solutions for sustainable food security and resilience, March is designed to develop and manage value chains of all agricultural activities and products by upgrading along the value chain, production, post-production, and appropriate policies to achieve full security and resilience. We need smart solutions to land use planning for land allocation and to overcome the complicated land tenure system, conflicts and rampant estate development, and unregulated mining causing damage to agricultural lands. Stakeholders and beneficiaries within the agricultural value chain also express gratitude for the positive changes in the agricultural landscape in the central region. Farmers and fishers who excelled in the year under review were awarded. Assembly aims to invest in climate smart technology to promote sustainable agriculture and empower small scale farmers. The initiative, which would include the training of farmers in new technologies and the provision of farm inputs and seedlings, is targeted at enhancing the livelihoods of beneficiaries. There's more in this report. North Dine is an agrarian district in the Volta region where the majority of residents depend on farming for livelihood. They produce cereals and tuba crops and engage in animal farming and fishing, among others. However, climate change continues to have an impact on the agricultural sector of the district. Given this, the North Dine District Chief Executive, Edmond Kujo Atta, underscored the imperative need to adopt climate smart technology in farming. He was addressing the 39th National Farmers Day in Amfuega, Wademahe. As a district, our goal is to empower small scale farmers and promote sustainable agriculture through the provision of comprehensive climate smart farming services, thereby generate more revenue and enhance livelihood resources for our farmers and communities. Consequently, the District Assembly is currently nursing 12,000 coconut seedlings for distribution to interested farmers. Free! Free! This is being funded under the Ghana Priority Safety Net Project. Mr. Atta identified the lack of land as a major stumbling block in harnessing the agricultural potential of the district. Zoom line of bay, because you know you have a ball at all. That you don't know you have a zoom rice. That you have a demon, you have a gun. That you have a demon, you have a gun. At least 300 acres. Similarly, National Youth Authority told Oha Mieka Wadika, over Yoha Yola Imbadi, at least 100 acres. What support on her? But what that bread? Miena, Agritonia, Oteremion, Badovizia, Metopo and Bamao. I'm humbly asking my relatives. My queens to help us in this regard. You can imagine the three youth who would have otherwise benefited from this if it takes effect in North Dine. The North Dine District Director of Agriculture, Nusianu Avejida, implored the youth to take advantage of the government's flagship programs to become entrepreneurs. I would encourage the youth to make most of the business prospects in the agricultural value chain as they take advantage of government flagship programs by starting their own businesses. Mr. Chairman, as we celebrate Farmers Day, let us not only acknowledge the arduous labor of our farmers, but also pledge ourselves to a future of intelligent and sustainable agriculture. Deserving farmers and a fisherman were awarded 
respected and celebrated for their distinctive contribution to the food basket of the district. The Chief Executive Officer of Crisfall Farms, Reverend Dr. Christian Ahoto, was adjudged the district best farmer. He called for the provision of logistics to enable farmers to add value to their produce to maximize profit. Fred Kwame Asari, Joy News, Amfega Wademahe. Newly crowned Upper West Regional Best Farmer, 48-year-old Doho Somalia, has appealed to government to rescind the decision on the restriction imposed on the export of soya beans. He noted that the lifting of the ban will pave way for farmers in the region to increase your production. There's more in this report by Rafiq Salam. There have never been any doubt for over 10 years as a wood district or municipality where the overall Upper West Regional Best Farmer comes from. It is always between farmers from the Sisala East and West District who compete among themselves. Last year was the turn of National Health Insurance Authority's accountant, turned farmer John Dumont of Sisala West, who surprisingly beat the sway for farmers that were lined up for the award at Nandrum. Farmers from neighboring Sisala East has been gnashing their teeth to their eastern neighbors and blood relations. In 48-year-old Doho Sumela, they have a formidable well-grounded farmer who swore to bring back the lost glory to the municipality. Doho Sumela is a teacher by profession who left teaching to pursue his childhood dream in farming. He is currently the presiding member of the Sisal East Municipal Assembly. This farming season alone, he has cultivated over 1,200 acres of maize, soya bean, millet, and rice. He also cultivated several species of leguminous crops and tubers of yam. It was therefore not surprising when he was chosen out of the 10 best farmers in the region as the overall best farmer. For his award, he was given a motorkin and other farming equipment. He dedicated the award to his family, especially his wife and the people of the Sisala East. I want to dedicate this award to my beautiful wife, the entire family, and the people of Sisala land. Being a farmer is not an easy task. There are so many things involved in it. Leaving your family at home, being the bush, you can clearly see that. If you don't have a committed wife, if you don't have a committed family, certainly you cannot achieve what you want in the fall. Those who merely use the opportunity to call on the government to rescind a decision on restrictions imposed on the export of soy bean. There has been a limited restriction on marketing of soy beans. I'm seriously appealing to the government of Ghana through the Honorable Regional Minister for Government to actually reconsider the restriction placed or ban on soybean. If this is done, what it means is that a lot of farmers are going to be in business. Huru Yasana was a judge, a regional best livestock farmer, was Adam of Fulera, one of the best regional women's farmer. 39-year-old Brahma Suleimana was addressed as the best farmer in the one municipality among 34 farmers. Our power senior minister, Dr. Aviz Bin Sali, speaking on the theme of the celebration, called on all to embrace some solutions to revolutionize farming. Smart solution encompasses a range of modern technologies and practices that can revolutionize how we farm. Precision agriculture, data-driven decision-making, and the use of advanced machinery are just a few examples. These technologies enhance productivity and contribute to sustainability by optimizing resource use, minimizing waste, and mitigating the impact of climate change. Important for the news, Rafik Salam, Zingu. Well, that's it for Joy Newsroom. My name is Faustina Safa. For more news, please log on to myjoyonline.com. Up next is The Law with Samson Ladi. Do stay tuned in.